Good afternoon, this is Dr. Dan Guerra coming to you from Verev Med Studios in the Pacific Northwest slash Inland North, Northern Rockies. Today is a special day because it is St. Patrick's Day. Now, I myself am not Irish, but I have plenty of family members who are. So because of that, I try to um, admire that holiday at least as much as I can. As you can tell from the way that I've altered the logo for Vera Med, I've turned everything green today. So that's certainly a way to honor St. Patrick's Day. Now, I will mention that in two days is St. Joseph's Day, which is the special day for us Italians. And that color is usually red. So if I can get around to it, I'm going to try to give another Vera Med lecture in two days. And then you'll see the logo and other kinds of... Uh, uh, lettering and whatnot turned red. So anyways, let's get started. After I've explained all that to you. All right. So today we are going to basically continue upon the arc and axis that I've been following for the last three lectures. That is, we've been doing a little bit of neuropsychiatry. And particularly, we've been talking about drugs of abuse and drugs of addiction. We talked about um, marijuana. We talked about alcohol slash ethanol. And uh, the third thing we talked about were the opiates. Today, we're going to um, mention cocaine because that's kind of what the paper is about that we're going to uh, dissect today. Uh, we're going to look at some real data rather than review articles. But I want you to keep in mind, and I will try to bring forward keep in mind, that uh, this, these discussions are relevant to what we uh, covered in the last three lectures. So let's get started. Again, that's me, Dr. Guerra. Uh, there is my email address. You can contact me directly uh, if you want to discuss any of these lectures or you want to talk about Verav Med, the company that I co-founded with a former student. There is our website and there is our email address for contacting us directly through Verav Med. You can get all the information you need about our company there. Basically, we are a consulting company that brings the published research into uh, your laptop. And we discuss with you whatever interest you may have, uh, be you a physician, be you a pharmacist, be you a um, veterinarian, a lawyer, or a regular person who wants to know more about what is being actually published in the scientific literature relative to things in biomedicine. And also the very uh, peculiar cases of things just in organic chemistry, chemistry, and of course, biochemistry, which is what I do. Pathology, physiology, pathophysiology, uh, drug interactions, all these things are covered. We have a quite a large gambit of discussions. All right, and there's my Facebook page. Facebook is where you're going to find all of these relevant Verev Med uh, YouTube imprinted lectures, and they're all free. Uh, we do the lectures for free and our consulting and the rest of our company, of course, we work under contract. Today is indeed the 17th of March, 2018, which means it's St. Patrick's Day. And as I said, that's why it's green. Now, uh, this is a, a photograph I took when I cut down this tree last summer in the St. Joe Clearwater National Forest. You can see I was filling it up here. And I thought this might not be a bad metaphor for saying appropriated brain ketogenesis. We appropriate something. And in so doing, uh, there might be a, a positive act aspect to it, uh, like hauling away the wood uh, in this case. But in terms of drugs of abuse and drugs of addiction, um, it's not such a good thing. And that's what we're going to try to bring forward here today. Okay. So the paper we're going to really discuss is right here. Um, it published, it's still in press, but it will be coming out probably uh, very soon, probably in the next uh, month or so. All right, <laughs> so let's cover the introduction. The central nervous system actually uses about 20% of all the energy in the body. Now that does not include when you have uh, a, a lot of extra exercise you're doing, like let's say you're running or you're digging a ditch or you're cutting down a tree, then more of the metabolic budget will be of course sent to the skeletal muscle. Um, but the brain always uses about 20% of the energy budget. So there's a lot of activity there, at least if your brain is functional. Hopefully your brain is functional. There is a potential link between drug exposure and the regulation of cerebral bioenergetics. As you might guess, bioenergetics is, a, is where you get your energy, the synthesis of ATP and utilization thereof. 
And so you might guess that um, drugs, which you know have a tremendous alteration of your consciousness, may also affect bioenergetics. And so that's kind of like what the topic is here today. So in fact, it is indeed the topic today. So the most common CNS oxidizable carbon substrate is always glucose, okay? Glucose is where we get um, all of the electrons uh, from the oxidation of that carbohydrate um, through the reduction of NADH and the reoxidation of NADH and FADH2 in the electron transport chain to push protons through the inner mitochondrial membrane and back through the proton pumping uh, complex 5 ATP, a synthesizing ATP into the mitochondrial matrix, and then the movement of that ATP out and utilization for all of the things necessary for the brain to do. If you want to think about what the brain's work is, why it needs all this ATP, just think about all the synaptic activity, the transport of all the neurotransmitters, all the action potentials that are generated in the brain, that's where the ATP is necessary. All that movement, for example, of the messenger RNA protein synthesis along that axon and down into the boutons and, and where the synaptic cuff is, occurs, that takes a lot of metabolic energy. Yeah. Now, besides glucose, which is the most common substrate in the brain, ketone bodies, by that I mean beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and even acetone itself, <laughs> the ketone itself, <laughs> uh, they can be alternate energy substrates, particularly during stress. And that stress can be a lot of things. It can be hypoxia. It can be ischemia associated with hypoxia. And it can even be just hypoglycemia. Less glucose, you're going to need some carbon source because you can't let that brain down. And the carbon source can then become a fuel generated from fatty acid. It's been demonstrated that illicit drug use, this is the this is the movement now into the topic today, alters cerebral bioenergetics, as I alluded to, and that's what this paper is all about. Cocaine abuse in particular alters brain glucose metabolism in multiple brain regions. In general, all psychostimulants, that would include things like amphetamine and cocaine, uh, in, induce bioenergetic disruption in the nucleus accumbens. Now we've talked about the NAC before, the nucleus accumbens before, relative to the emotion center and the conduit between the nucleus accumbens, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex in terms of executive decision and also drug uh, effects in the brain. So the nucleus accumbens should not be something that you haven't heard before or sound unusual. And today we're going to try to focus on the nucleus accumbens because that's what this paper is about. All right. Now, saying all of that, and if you watch the last three lectures, um, the nucleus accumbens is actually involved in drug dependency. That's because it links emotion with things like uh, nociception, as we talked about in opiates. So once you link emotional drive, or that is the dopaminergic circuit associated with reward pathway, to things like pain amelioration, right, or analgesia, then right away you can see that the two can confound one another and that's possibly how you become dependent and eventually maybe addicted to a drug. Okay. Cocaine induced uh, nucleus accumbens glycolysis is greatly reduced and it's compensated for, as this paper will show us, by ketone body utilization. Now that's something that's probably um, not hard to understand because I just said you need an alternate fuel. If you're not running glycolysis, which is the uh, oxidative pathway for uh, glucose utilization, which generates only a few ATPs, but you make the carbon pyruvate, uh, the carbon source pyruvate, which if pyruvate dehydrogenase is functioning, will enter into the TCA cycle in the mitochondria in the form of acetyl-CoA and in the form of oxalacetic acid via those two reactions, pyruvate dehydrogenase, pyruvate uh, carboxylase. Those two reactions will then synthesize uh, acetyl-CoA and OAA, they'll condense and make citrate during the citric acid cycle, make NADH and FADH2, which is a reoxidized electrotransport chain, protons, electrons push back through, uh, and driving ATP synthesis. That is corrupted if you look at glycolytic pathways. So that means glucose utilization is going to be in disrepair. So cocaine also down-regulates the transcription of oxfos pathway genes. Now that might seem to be paradoxical, but if you have less carbon entering the oxfos pathway, then it's very likely that, that an overexpression of those genes could lead to the production of reactive oxygen. So this might actually be a compensatory mechanism to keep the brain 
free or a diminished uh, level of the production of reactive oxygen, which of course can cause neurodegeneration. Okay. All right, now this slide came from one of those previous talks, and I'm just using it again uh, for the same reason that I did then. I want to show you a little bit about how the prefrontal cortex does a top-down guidance of attention and thought to the, all the sensory cortices. It also works to inhibit inappropriate actions by getting into the arousal reward systems. And it also regulates emotion, okay? So from the dorsal to the ventral regions of the PFC, all of this functioning, all this neural circuitry is controlling uh, basal metabolic rate, um, motor activity, uh, sensorial activity and the entire affect or emotional centers. So as we said last time, prefrontal cortex regulates attention, behavior, and emotion through this extensive network of extensions. Uh, um, dorsal regions, which are in the blue, okay, subserve higher cognitive functions and regulate the top-down attention through extensive projections into the posterior cortical regions. That's all the stuff down here. In contrast, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, this is the ventral medial down here, that's where we believe that emotion is regulated. So you get extensive projections, as I said, into the subcortical areas such as the amygdala and also the nucleus accumbens and the brainstem. Okay, that's shown down here in these red arrows. So the right inferior frontal cortex, or the IFC, is specialized for the inhibition of inappropriate motor responses, such as control of things like tardive dyskinesia. And the prefrontal cortex itself is positioned to control everything, including behavior. All right. All right. So that I want you to keep that in mind. Now, high resolution magnetic resonance imaging scans on young adults, recreational marijuana users, and non using controls revealed greater ma uh, gray matter density arborization. Again, this comes from my first talk in this series, uh, which was early last week. Um, and you see that in the nucleus accumbens extending into the subcolossal cortex, hypothalamus, subdenticular, extending the amygdala, and the, in the left amygdala. All these are all limbic regions, by the way. In young recreational marijuana users, structural abnormalities in gray matter density, volume, and the shape of that nucleus accumbens and amygdala are observed. Findings, this is MRI, so this is actually human beings. These are not animal studies, okay? Non-invasive procedure. Findings suggested further study of marijuana effects would need to inform uh, discussion on legalization of marijuana. We talked about this last time. The results extend prior studies into showing the drugs of abuse that are known to elevate dopaminergic pathways, that's a reward pathway, are associated with structural and more abnormalities, including things like tetrahydrocannabinol from marijuana, and you get related disruptions in behavior. We know there's tremendous behavioral changes because that's why people use the drug recreationally and maybe also for the so-called uh, pain removal. So the paper from Synapse, psychoactive drugs alter the structure of neurons in the prefrontal cortex and in the nucleus accumbens. And this is animal model studies. Okay, so these are going to be anatomical studies, not just simply uh, imaging, but actual dissection, neurosurgery to look at those uh, the, look at those uh, cerebral regions. We talked about THC, THC injections in lab animals correlated with alterations in dendritic arborization, the prefrontal cortex, and we showed you basically that uh, excessive arborization can cause a fuzziness, which means there's a decrease in the amount of uh, linkage of the dendrites to functional synaptic clefts. And because of that, you get an alteration in the signaling, that is the extra potentials, and confusion can occur, and lots of other behavioral changes because of that, uh, and linked, of course, to emotional status. So arborization isn't always good, even though in some it is considered neuroplasticity. Now, the reward and pleasure pathway that has been well described in the brain involves the so-called dopaminergic circuit that is connected between the ventral tegmental area, the VTA, and the nucleus accumbens. The VTA is located in the midbrain, directly proximal to the brainstem, and is considered an early evolutionary relic of earlier, more primitive brain structures. All animals have circuit like this, okay? probably for just appetitive behavior, the desire for food and water, for example. VTA is where dopamine is synthesized from, of course, the amino acid L-tyrosine. 
Dopamine produced by the VTA is sent to the nucleus of commons via the axons, which link the two via the synaptic cleft, of course. The PFC is linked to this circuit. It provides executive decision-making, as we've been talking about. And that's the overall overarching executive decision control over the pleasure reward pathway. That is, I've had enough, stop. I've had enough, I won't take any more of this, that kind of thing, right? Uh, or I feel sated, I'm full. If you talk about regular uh, appetitive regions of just dietary uh, utilization. This neural circuit is regionally connected via a group of neurons generally called the MFB, which is the medial forebrain bundle. The medial forebrain bundle is also connected to the hypothalamus and the amygdala. And of course, the amygdala is where the neural circuitry seems to be associated with fear and anger. Uh, I published a paper recently uh, that is a uh, chapter in a book on anger. And uh, in one of my previous talks, I have uh, directed you to, to attention to that if you want to take a look at it. I've also looked at fear a lot in, in neuropsychiatric uh, publications. Serotonin which we all know about is, is, is what is elevated or is um, pharmaceutically elevated in SSRI uh, uh, drug use. Serotonin serves to inhibit the desire generating dopaminergic pathway. Okay, it actually inhibits it. Serotonin therefore generates satiety to balance the response. That's what serotonin is actually doing. So when you inhibit its reuptake, you're, you're dampening the dopaminergic response. And people have, uh, that uh, are taking that drug for major depressive disorder might may think of again this is paradoxical, but it basically blunts the lows that one gets after the high of the dopaminergic surge. Okay, it's a simplified way of putting it. Now, all drugs of abuse target the brain's pleasure center. That's the dopaminergic center. So here you see the nucleus accumbens, frontal cortex. Okay. The uh, ventral tegmental area, these are very generalized, show you in the human brain. Those brain circuits are important for natural rewards, food, music. When you listen to a Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, or you listen to Mozart's 23rd Piano Concerto, or you listen to the Beatles' Hey Jude, um, uh, or you listen to a Bach cantata, uh, um, or you um, are, are otherwise feeling pleasure because you just had a tremendous corned beef and cabbage because it's St. Patrick's Day, all of that is linked to this reward pathway. Okay, there's nothing unusual about it. So here, uh, thinking about that corned beef, cabbage, and the uh, uh, and and the meat, think about like when you eat food. What happens is that you get this regular dopaminergic transport. Okay, it binds to this receptor, and you get that feeling of satiety. You get that feeling of pleasure from eating the corned beef. Right now. What happens when you take a drug, a, a psychostimulant, is that you turn this on like heavy duty, you overactivate it, overactivate it many fold, right, logarithmically, not arithmetically, right? It's not just tuning it up 5%, 10%, it's tuning it up 10 fold, 20 fold, 50 fold maybe, especially if these drugs are used chronically as the drugs of abuse often are. Um, so what happens is you overload this circuit completely, you get this overload of dopamine, so typically dopamine increases in response to natural rewards as food, as I said. When cocaine is taken, dopamine increases are exaggerated and the communication itself is altered. What do I mean by communication? All of that really fine-tuned, evolutionarily adapted neural circuitry becomes corrupted just by the intake of one individual drug, particularly chronic use of it and uh, overextension of it, because as we talked about many times, you become more and more dependent on drugs and you need more and more of the drug because the circuitry that you're impacting, for example, the dopaminergic circuit, and that also involves all of the signal transduction cascades going through voltage-gated channels, all of that gets overloaded so much of those receptors get endocytosed, so more and more of the drug is needed. So you get more of a tolerance to the drug, and basically it just becomes um, a zero end game. More and more of the drug is needed, more and more of the drug starts causing damage, and eventually a person doesn't feel much of anything at all. Certainly not natural pleasures no longer um, have any effect, and that's why people who become drug addicted become really uh, not very nice human beings. All right. So it is the nucleus accumbens which activates the motor cortex and the prefrontal cortex, which controls the response via the attentional direction and the duration. So the nucleus accumbens, I can't overemphasize how important it is in this whole system. It means that both the reasoning and the emotional systems play a role in the reward pathway. And we all know this, right? 
the reward system is a matter of tremendous interest from two fields of neuropsychology because of all the things we just mentioned. The first is the anatomical and functional evolution of the brain, which itself is extremely interesting if you have a scientific mind. And the latter, of course, is this really serious problem of drug addiction, which we have in humans. So recreational drugs all impact that reward pleasure system, including ethanol. Remember, that's a drug. Ethanol is a toxin and a drug, a neurotoxin and a drug. So all of those of you that are drinking a lot of alcohol today because St. Patrick's Day, well, if you take my advice, you don't need to drink any alcohol. You should be able to get pleasure just in being with your friends. Anyway, uh, that's my um, uh, civic duty of today. I try to say that alcohol abuse, in fact, alcohol use probably doesn't make any sense for your brain. Um, Okay, so recreational drugs all impact the reward pleasure system through various biochemical mechanisms involving synthesis, pre and postsynaptic cleft transport, reception and degradation of neurotransmitters. Okay, the whole grouping of trans neurotransmitters that we talked about in previous discussions, glutamate, GABA, uh, uh, neuro neuropeptides, all the different circuitry that we discussed. It is believed that the reward system evolved through a function of self-preservation. Maybe that's why animals seem to have the same vestigial pathway. Self-preservation includes you get pleasure from something, but you also get the penalty of too much pleasure. And that's why it's shut down, right? Such as overeating. Uh, all right. An example would be you do something, it's pleasurable. And so you repeat the behavior, okay? In the evolutionary biological adaptation literature, this would involve things like mate selection, mating itself as sexual activity, uh, but also protection and rearing of the young and long-term relational ties, something really important in mammals, particularly human beings. Unfortunately, recreational drugs, which are certainly not things that are um, a problem in the other parts of the animal kingdom, uh, recreational drugs hype and they hijack that reward pathway and eventually bring such a strong response of pleasure that the natural behaviors become master altogether unrecognized. That's why people lose interest in their family and their job and everything else, and they become just sole source interested in their drugs of choice like alcohol or cocaine or even things like marijuana uh, and amphetamine, of course. In essence, this is a reason why people may become addicted to a drug and lose interest in their family, love becomes lost, as they say. Again, opiates, another key feature there. You can perhaps see the correlation to other forms of addiction, as in greed, lust, and power over others. These are all impacting that same circuitry in the brain. Okay? They all generate a sense of well-being one way or another, sometimes paradoxically and aberrantly, certainly, and they intensified that reward circuit. That's why all of these potential behaviors are themselves potentially addictive. Now, okay, here's a paper describing HMG coa synthase 2. Okay, now this is a recently published paper. This is in uh, neuropharmacology. Again, it's in press, so it's got a, a date of issue in late 2017, but it's still in press. So I don't think you're going to find it in the journal probably until. Uh, April of this year, 2018. Okay, so it's a brand new paper. Now, embedded over here on the right are just my standard biochemical slides showing you um, how fatty acids are broken down via beta oxidation. Um, you can generate acetyl-CoA, that is the final end product of fatty acid oxidation, utilization of fatty acids for things like bioenergetics. Uh, you can take two acetyl-CoAs and condense them via the thiolase reaction to make acetoacetyl-CoA. Add one more acetyl-CoA, very important enzyme called HMG-CoA synthase, hydroxymethylglutero-CoA synthase. There it is, okay? Now that's a six carbon compound. Now what happens is you break that back down, you remove an acetyl-CoA, okay? So this is just basically thioester chemistry. And you make now acetoacetate, which is no longer a CoA ester, so it doesn't form my cells, it doesn't stay in the cell, it's freely dissociated out of the cell because it's very water soluble. And that's the ketone body. Now, we make one more really important ketone body, and that's beta hydroxybutyrate, shown here with beta hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase. In fact, this enzymatic reaction 
is linked directly to the source NADH. If there's enough NADH around, you make beta-hydroxybutyrate. If there's not, you just end up with acetoacetate. These are both the major serum ketone bodies. Now, when the liver synthesizes these, this is liver mitochondria, so this is your standard way of making ketone bodies because if you need a lot of ketone bodies, like during starvation, which is why this system is probably in existence, starvation or just fasting, glucose levels drop, right? Lipid reserves are brought in, you get lipase activity, you get mobilization to the lipoproteins, you transport uh, lipids into the liver, the liver goes through fatty acid oxidation, you make the ketone bodies, they enter the bloodstream, and now that carbon goes to the rest of the body. Okay, so you enter into, for example, the brain, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, you just reverse the process, you make acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA enters the standard tricarboxylic acid cycle, you make NADH and FADH2, which then get reoxidized via the electron transport chain. Again, the same old saw, you go through uh, complex five, you make ATP uh, through the proton pumping ATPase, and that's what you do. You utilize that carbon that you had originally synthesized in the liver. That's now normal ketogenesis ketone utilization pathway. We're talking about something different here. We're talking about these pathways maybe both functioning within the brain itself. Okay. Okay. Now, Take a look at this, very cool. Astrocyte-located beta-oxidation is associated with cocaine and amphetamine abuse. So remember, the astrocytes are the glial cells, right? These aren't the neurons. These are the glial cells that actually involve a whole lot of regulation of neuronal activity. Actually, they appropriate and direct neuronal extension and all the neuronal tracts that exist in the central nervous system are controlled by astrocytes. Now, also astrocytes are associated with myelination, right? So there's a whole lot of really important activity of non-neuronal cells in the brain, such as astrocytes, which are a form of glia. So both ketone bodies and lactate are used for neuronal oxidative metabolism under stress conditions. We know this. Uh, and that's like what's associated with drug-enhanced synaptic activation. So remember that psychostimulant drugs cause a person to be overstimulated. That requires lots of energy because you're getting a lot of action potential firing in the brain. More ATP is needed. How is that accommodated? Well, especially when you think about the fact that glucose needs to be transported and it needs to have, be abundant enough to keep up with that enhanced neural transmission. So what happens in the brain is it gets hijacked and it gets hijacked in such a way as the glycolysis becomes limiting and fatty acid utilization becomes prominent, just like we talked about the stress response, okay? Okay, let's take a look at this. Well, keto bisolactate are used for neuronal oxidative metabolism, as I said, to enhance the synaptic activation from psychostimulation from drugs. Ketone bodies are converted to acetyl-CoA, which enters the TCA cycle as I went through this whole process to make ATP. Now, this is important. Mitochondrial 3 hydroxy 3 methylglucoenzyme synthase, this enzyme right here, acts at the rate-limiting step for ketogenesis, as you can see, transforming acetoacetyl-CoA to beta-hydroxymethylglucoenzyme, and then, it, of course, you make acetoacetate by this lyase reaction. And then because of the hydrogenation, make the second ketone body. Okay, understood. Ketone body utilization and ketogenesis are not competing pathways. That should be a T there, sorry. And may operate simultaneously. Why is that? Because here's biosynthesis and here's utilization. Now, it doesn't mean that there couldn't be a competition for these compounds, right? Or there could be a buildup. But if you're burning the ketone bodies, as you're synthesizing them from fatty acid or from non-fatty acid substrates, such as branched-chain amino acids, which are also ketogenic, remember, um, some of them anyway, um, then you're going to, need to see a constant flow in this way, just like the flow is through the body. You've got the same flow in the brain, particularly if the carbon's coming from the astrocyte feeding the neuron. So this is basically just one cell type to another. So it doesn't mean the astrocyte is utilizing the ketone bodies. No, no. It's giving the fuel to the neuron and the, the synaptic cleft where the energy is required. You see. All right. Uh, I'm a biochemist. you got to look at these structures. I'm not even going to say I'm sorry. You know you should. There's just a pathway. There's two acetyl-CoA making acetoacetyl-CoA. Here's the enzyme. Uh, beta hydroxymethylglucoenzyme synthase. You've got to remove one of those thioesters because you've got two of them, right? This is adding your third acetyl-CoA, right? 
Now you've made the six carbon compound, HMG CoA. In fact, those of you, I know many of you are uh, aficionados and want to be biochemist, you know the HMG CoA is also a precursor for cholesterologenesis. Now, this is happening in the mitochondria, the cytosol, and that's all I need to say for those of you in the know. All right. Anyway, uh, once you go through the lyase reaction, you make acetoacetate and some acetyl CoA, which feeds back into the pathway, and you're on your way to being ketogenic. Yeah, all thioesteric chemistry driving this. There's your last reaction. Remember, this is dependent on um, membrane concentr- membrane associated NADH, which means it's going to be linked ultimately to electron transport chain. Indeed, it is. Okay, and make the hydroxybutyrate, hydroxybutyrate, and acetoacetate freely water soluble, making the bloodstream. They also can transverse from the astrocyte into the neuron. Okay. Uh, once you then you once you make those ketone bodies, you utilize them either from beta hydroxybutyrate uh, uh, from the alcohol or from the ketone. Uh, and to utilize it, you need succinyl CoA come from the TCA cycle. Um, so this last reaction, beta ketoacyl CoA transferase, right? You're now adding back CoA. Now you're trapping this carbon. You make acetoacetyl CoA, thiolase that out. You make acetyl CoA. Boom. Where does it go? TCA cycle, what does it do? And the DH, every DH2 reoxidation instead of ATP synthesis. All right. Now, something that we have to back up and think about here is that where's the carbon coming from? So we talked about ketogenesis, but that's not where the carbon comes from. Where does that carbon come from? The acetyl CoA. Well, remember how fatty acids are made. Okay. Fatty acid uh, synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm where you start off with, uh, you know, adding malonyl CoA, which is a three carbon compound. You drive off carbon dioxide, driving that condensation reaction to make beta ketoacyl ACP. You do this reduction, you do the dehydration, the second reduction, you start increasing chain length of fatty acid. Now, biosynthesis is separated from beta oxidation. Has to be, because otherwise you'd have a futile cycle. But beta oxidation is basically just taking the fatty acid now, running it back into the, running it into the mitochondria uh, via the carnitine pomidogrel transferase reactions, go from coi to oxygen ester to coi back into the mitochondrial matrix. Um, you know, ultimately you break down that fatty acyl coi and look, you're making now FADH2 and NADH in the mitochondria. You think that's useful? You betcha. What's it useful for? <sighs> Driving the electron transport chain, right? Now, often what happens in the liver, for those of you again who are uh, uh, biochemistry aficionados or biochemical wannabes, um, you know that what the liver is doing during this breakdown of fats is it's also s- generating ATP for what? Gluconeogenesis. Now that is another possible thing that could be happening in the brain, but the brain, rather than go through the whole concern about resynthesizing glucose, can just use the reducing power generated from all this ketone body synthesis and utilization to drive the TCA cycle. That's indeed what seems to be happening. So the present study here, now that was just your little very short course in biochemistry. If you want to take a full course biochemistry, contact me. I'd be glad to hook you up directly, as that's what I do. Present study will suggest the cocaine-induced nucleus accumbens reprogramming via activated ketogenesis. Now the brain ketogenesis, not the liver. Switching from ketogenesis back to glycolysis, sorry for that double two there, regains homeostasis and cocaine induced behavior actually is attenuated. So once you move away from the ketogenesis, that psychostimulation, that over psychostimulation, which cause is caused by psychostimulus like cocaine and phenamine, then starts to diminish when you go back to glycolysis. And isn't that interesting how intermediary metabolism plays a role in the actual feeling people get from taking these drugs. So Cocaine actually induces that HMG CoA synthase, the, the isoform 2, which is the one we're talking about here because it's the one that's in the mitochondria. And it may function as a gatekeeper reaction that distorts bioenergetic reprogramming. Normal bioenergetic reprogramming during, for example, during hypoglycemia or ischemia, which can happen all the time in the brain. Here you're inducing this by taking this drug. You're throwing in a bad player. Here's some data. All right. Now, what you're looking at here are time after um, uh, cocaine ingestion, okay? And you're looking at the amount of ATP levels. You see that ATP levels are decreased after a single dose, 30 minutes. There's one hour. And then a repeated dose of cocaine, you see that the ATP levels start to drop. Now, why is that? Didn't I just tell you make more ATP? Yeah, but you're switching from glycolysis to ketogenesis, ketone utilization. That takes time. 
Okay. Also notice that the concentration of acetyl CoA starts to drop. Now the reason that is because pyruvate dehydrogenase becomes inhibited because of the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase reaction. So ATP and acetyl CoA levels drop for seven days of repeat cocaine in ingestion. The classic reward pathway, that's what this is showing you here, a classic reward pathway is just looking at how you, this is an animal model system. Classic reward pathway modulated by cocaine significantly increases. That means there's more hyperactivity, okay? Consistent with the suppression of ATP and acetyl-CoA by cocaine and reduction in the NADH, sorry, this is cut off here, uh, NAD to NADH ratio, which shows unfavorable TCA activity, notable that this uh, citrate synthase reaction actually increases initially. That's because that will increase when you lower the amount of ATP, you, uh, you, you alter this ratio so you have a high NAD to NADH ratio and you have uh, a decrease in acetyl-CoA. That's all going to build up a citrate synthase reaction in the TCA cycle. Now that's important because initially that's where all the carbon is going to go. And ultimately it could go run the entire cycle and you know you have to run the cycle because ketone utilization needs succinyl-CoA, remember? Now, this is just looking at uh, overall, all of these, these are all different compounds that were measured here using mass spectroscopy in this study in animals. And what they were asking is, is there a change in any of these metabolites? And there's like a decrease in choline and phosphocholine. And I'm not going to get into what that might mean in terms of phospholipid metabolism right now. But it's an interesting story. They didn't talk about it. I have a real interesting take on it, but I'm probably not going to cover it today. So, all right, now what is increased? There's a big increase in the ketone bodies. Look at that. How much fold? Like almost a five-fold increase, almost a seven-fold increase in acetoacetate. What else you see is an increase in is N-acetylglutamate. Now, they don't make a big deal about that, but I do. Because N-acetylglutamate is an obligate allosteric activator for carbamyl phosphate synthase. That enzyme is the rate-limiting reaction for urea genesis. And that could suggest an increased protein turnover. I think that's important because think about carbon source. You're not doing a whole lot of maybe fatty acid de novo biosynthesis. You're doing maybe the, the intake uptake of fatty acid. There's CD36, for example. There are receptors that will allow fatty acids to pass the blood-brain barrier and be utilized directly from the bloodstream, okay, from lipoproteins, for example, from via lipoprotein lipase reactions. Yeah. That's all true, but where else could carbon come from immediately from protein degradation? Remember that psychostimulant drugs also cause neurodegeneration. Degeneration, think proteolytic degradation. Okay? And maybe that's why you get this uptick. That's a pretty good uptick in NAG. NAG is an allosteric effector of ureogenesis, which means you're getting a lot of free ammonia generated. Ammonia is toxic in the brain. Boy, is it toxic. It's a neurotoxin. So it gets removed by running ureogenesis. That seems to play an interesting role here, not discussed in this paper, but something I'm sure that we'll follow up on eventually. So here's all the different colors to, to generate. Uh, what you're looking at is amino acid metabolism. There's a little bit of an increase of that. That makes sense from polyolytic degradation. But the big story here is the big ketone production. And I made a big deal out of this in acetylglutamate because it's an allosteric effector. And I know how that can play a role in ureogenesis. All right. Now we're looking at individual genes, all of which are tuned up at the mRNA level because of this cocaine ingestion. Okay, so now I'm going to put on the glasses. Right. Okay, my, uh, uh, my eyes have been improved. Now these are genes involved in glycolysis. These are genes in the TCA cycle, oxfos, fatty acid oxidation, ketogenesis, and ketone metabolism or ketone utilization. The blue means down regulation, and you go from Roy G. Biv, or you go backwards from low wave, uh, um, uh, low wavelength. That is, uh, yeah, lo low wavelength to high wavelength. Okay, so uh, blue means that you get down regulation. Red means you get up regulation. Red means warm. This is like a heat map. Okay, all these genes here, as you move through this system, are being increased. And these are being decreased. And that's what they're showing you here. So neural energy metabolism with no drug 
you're getting glucose uptake. Glucose is being uh, uh, run through the glycolytic pathway. You're making some lactate. Lactate can also come in. You can store some lactate. You can send lactate back out. But for pyruvate dehydrogenase then allows, this is the reaction right here, allows for the synthesis of acetyl coy What's not showing you it also, pyruvate carboxylic makes OAA. I don't know why they'd ever show that. I guess because they're not biochemists. You make OAA, you make acetyl coy you can then make citrate, you run the TCA cycle. This is normal physiology. What do we say? The brain likes glucose. The brain likes glucose. I'll say it one more time. The brain likes glucose. But during ischemia, during a hypoxia, uh, and uh, which could all, li all limit the blood flow at some level or stress or damage to the brain or indeed intoxication like the neuropsychostimulants, uh, all of that can be pirated. And look what happens. Glycolysis, all the genes for glycolysis are shut down. Uh, the enzyme which blocks the activity, because when you phosphorylate pyruvate dehydrogenase, you inhibit its activity, but you get less of the gene being transcribed. These are messenger RNAs, remember. These are so just a transcript, transcriptome activity here. What goes down is glycolysis is shut down, but what's tuned up is fatty acid utilization. Okay, here's a carnitine palmitic transferase allowing for fatty acid oxidation. Those are the enzymes of beta oxidation. They're tuned up. Okay, see the colors changing here to more red, red shifting. Red shifting means tuned up, right? <clears throat> um, here's the synthesis of the ketone bodies over here. Okay, there's acetoacetate. Uh, there's uh, beta hydroxybutyrate. All the enzymes you see here in red are all tuned up. So you're getting fatty acid utilization. You're getting beta oxidation. You're getting ketogenesis. And you're also making, boom, acetyl-CoA. Here's your source of acetyl-CoA, not like glucose, but fatty acid or at least ketone bodies, right? Wherever you happen to be getting that acetyl-CoA from. I told you you can get that also from amino acid degradation. And we think that's happening because of that ureogenesis I talked about and because of neurodegeneration caused by drugs of abuse like cocaine. Anyway, you see what goes down here. You turn on part of the TCA pathway. You turn on that part of the TCA pathway that allows you to make NADH and FADH2 so that you can make ATP. And indeed, that's what's going on because here you can see in long-term uh, cocaine exposure, you actually do start to get a bit of an increase of oxidative phosphorylation uh, gene activity, okay? So you, you make enough ATP in the long run to drive all of that uh, neurotransmission, right? All that action potential, which causes the psychostimulation from a drug like cocaine and amphetamine. Now, it's not to say that you make a net amount of higher ATP. Remember the earlier uh, studies that we talked about the introduction, it seems like ATP becomes depressed. Remember glucose using glycolysis is a ready synthesis of ATP, a ready synthesis of ATP, whereas lipid utilization or ketone utilization, it means a constant source of ATP. And that's what happens in neuropsychostimulation with these drugs of abuse. Now, constant, constant, constant synaptic cleft activation, action potential activation is what is the hallmark of neuropsychostimulants. Okay? So that's what we're talking about here. It's not a spike only. It's a constant progression of carbon being burned up to drive that ATP synthesis to keep those neurons firing when they should not be firing at such a rapid rate. That's what causes, again, confusion. Also linked, of course, to the addiction eventually because the reward pathway is tuned up significantly because of the neural uh, linkages, because this is all happening, remember, in the nucleus accumbens. All this activity we're looking at is on nucleus accumbens activity. What do we say that is? That's the um, that's an emotional transducing signal, right, from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala uh, uh, through the nucleus accumbens, right? And then all down into the motor activity. All right. So now, they did inhibitor and short hairpin RNA studies in this paper. Chemical inhibition of the HMG coase synthase reaction, sorry, bad spelling there, sorry, or repression of translation of the messenger RNA from the short hairpin RNAs brought metabolism back to glycolytic flux even after cocaine pretreatment. That was, I'm not showing the data, but they had like two or three other uh, data sets to show that. I just summarized it here for you. Glucokinase activation restored, that comes back up when you inhibit the synthase or you inhibit. Uh, uh, the messenger RNA that's involved in making HMG CoA synthase by the short hairpin RNA. Right? Glucinus comes back up, glycolytic flux, flux comes back up, all within this background of HMG CoA synthase inhibition. 
So you're repealing back what happened with that cocaine when you target an upticking in glycolysis. Okay. Decreased locomotor activity is also another with restoration to glycolysis. You get the less of that neuropsychostimulation. All this worked perfectly in the animal model. So let's summarize and synthesize this information. Cocaine induces a bioenergetic reprogramming in the nucleus accumbens. You get a suppression of glycolysis and activation of both ketogenesis and oxidative phosphorylation, as well as ketone utilization. Reactivation of glycolysis switches cocaine-induced ketogenesis back to carbohydrate metabolism, thus weakening cocaine-induced locomotor hyperactivity, and the reward circuitry also is diminished. Possibility for a metered flow of carbon at day-to-be production is afforded by intermediate synthesis of the ketones to keep steady pulse of the locomotor activity as seen in the psychostimulants in general. And that's what I've been saying. Some protein metabolism and amino acid utilization, thus suggesting, I put a question mark there because they didn't study this, but that's what that NAG increase looked like to me, right? And acetylglutamine, uh, and acetylglutamic acid is an allosteric activator of the uh, urogenic pathway, okay, because it activates carbamylophosphate synthase, CPS, the isoform of that that generates ureogenesis, which means the removal of ammonia. You have to remove ammonia because you're using amino acids as a carbon source, full stop. So neurodegeneration may also result from cocaine use, and that's suggested from that amino acid uptake. So nucleus accumbens is well known to play a critical role in cognitive processing, aversion, motivation, reward, and reinforcement learning, are all of those impacted by cocaine use? You bet. Convergent transcriptomics and proteomics identify a positive change of glycolysis and ATP synthesis in the nucleus accumbens tissue from rats exposed to cocaine. That's what basically this paper said. Now, I want you to put this now in a bigger context. Here's a paper that was published, oh boy, how many years ago? 14 years ago. Remember, what I do when I look at the scientific literature is I dig deep. That's not really that long ago for someone like me. And so it's not a big deal, but I want you to notice something. Here was a proposed model 14 years ago for astrocyte mediated ketogenesis for neuronal maintenance, okay? Fatty acids, here you got carnitine palmitotransferase sending fatty acids in beta oxidation ketone bodies going from the astrocyte the mitochondria, to neural or neuronal metabolism. Okay, now this was all regulated because of this increase in AMP to ATP ratio because of decrease in ATP. Does that sound a little bit like this cocaine abuse? Yeah, okay. You increase the activity of AMP kinase, adenosyl monophosphate kinase, which blocks acetylchloric carboxylase, rate limiting step in fatty acid synthesis. Why is that important? When you tank MALCOA, you increase the amount of carnitine palmitoyl transferase one, which allows fatty acid flux ketogenesis and those ketone juice for neural metabolism. Holy smokes, 14 years ago, these people had a, a proposed model for astrocyte mediated ketogenesis for neuronal maintenance. This uh, came from this journal uh, and prostaglandins uh, and essential fatty acids, that's what PLEF is. That's the name of the journal and you can find this paper. Okay. I don't think it's free, uh, but you can look at the abstract and you can probably download if you have access to a library. Could cocaine dysregulate this pathway? That's what I'm asking. Thus causing both psychostimulation and eventual neurodegeneration. That is the argument I'm trying to propose. Again, I'm digging into literature. Now, here's one other paper we looked at. I looked at, bro, we. This is from ASN, a, a Japanese journal. It was first published, again, now four years ago. Okay. Not quite, but close to it. Lactate accumulates during hypoxia. Well, first, let's look at the title. Roles and regulation of ketogenesis where, whoa, in cultured astroglia and neurons under hypoxia and hypoglycemia. Same thing happens in cocaine use, right? Like neuropsychostimulation. Lactate accumulates during hypoxia. However, lactate and pre-rate oxidation decreased in neurons after hypoxia, even reoxygenation or reperfusion, while ketone body oxidation is preserved. Why is that? Pyritia hydrogenase is greatly reduced during hypoxia or cerebral stress, thus removing glycolysis as a potential avenue for carbon to the TCA. Once you knock out that pyritia hydrogenase, the source of acetyl-CoA, and again, it happens because of the increase in pyruvate, um, uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, remember? All of that then will lead to, hey, forget about glycolysis, forget about glucose utilization, you got to run the ketogenesis pathway. That's what they're talking about here. 
normal hypoxia, normal hypoglycemia, stress to the brain, okay? Astroglia and maybe neurons respond to hypoxia by enhancing keto body production and ketone bodies produced by the astroglia or neurons both by both be used for neuronal energy substrate. Yep, that makes perfect sense. See, this is the embedded pathway that's being pirated and abused by the neuropsychostimulant, cocaine, other amphetamines, and probably also uh, indirectly a lot of other kinds of drug interactions. Okay? The potential for astroglial ketogenesis reactivated amp kinase, there's, there's your um, connection to regulation, likely repairs ischemic cell damage, and you want to do that because you don't want neurodegeneration. Right. All right. Look at the nice green background again. I'm wearing green today uh, for St. Patrick's Day. Remember, that's not because I'm Irish, because I have Irish in my family. Okay, now, what I hope I covered here today in short order was a discussion of how cocaine impacts ketogenesis in the brain, particularly in the nucleus accumbens, which is that part of the brain associated with reward pathway, higher prefrontal cortical functions, related to things like uh, emotional regard to ingestion of neuropsychostimulants like cocaine and the normal reward pathway, which hopefully is functioning all the time when you feel good with just being with friends and you don't do all that ethanol intoxication. Hopefully you're not doing. At any rate, I'm going to end with this today. Uh, remember that I'm Dr. Dan Guerra. I'm at Vera Med, uh, Chief Scientific Officer and co-founder of that company. There's the email address for our company and the website. Remember, we're a scientist verifying published evidence for medical biosciences, which is what I just did. Um, there's my Facebook page. Go to that Facebook page. You're going to find all of these really cool um, lectures, right? And they're all absolutely for free. Uh, we hope that you contact us so that you can become our client, and I'll be able to go work just for you so that we can go into the literature and answer your specific questions about anything associated with biomedicine or even the basic principles supporting biomedicine, particularly things like physiology and biochemistry and pharmaceutical sciences. All right, so let's close this down. All we have to do now is say, have a really happy St. Patrick's Day, hopefully ethanol free, and bye for now.